Let's get started here. Welcome everyone. Um, thanks for joining today. I'm excited to talk about organic gardening methods and techniques in your garden. And um, as I said, I'm Faye Kuzman. I'm the horticulture agent here in Woodford County. And what I'm gonna talk about today is first, we're gonna talk a little bit about what organic means. Um, and go into a, a few uh, definitions there. And then we're gonna talk about five steps um, to building an organic uh, garden. And those will be the main steps we go through and then um, what actions you can take in your own garden. So first I'm gonna talk about um, some definitions of organic. So of course, for the home gardener, um, the definition of organic uh, varies. You might have your own definition, you know, everybody's definition, of, of how they do organic in their garden is different since there are no standards for that. Now, of course, through the United States Department of Agriculture, there is um, organic standards. As you know, in the grocery store, um, they have that organic seal, um, that USDA organic uh, logo, as you see in the top there. So certified organic farmers have to meet these standards through the United States Department of Agriculture uh, National Organic Program. And so uh, there's a lot of information on their website, the USDA's website about that. Um, but basically it's a term that um, says it's a food and other agricultural products that can be meats or vegetables or eggs, all kinds of things have been produced according to those standards. And so um, it also, that definition on the USDA website also talks about how organic agriculture integrates cult cultural, biological and mechanical practices that foster cycling of resources, promotes ecological balance and conserves biodiversity. Um, synthetic fertilizers, sewage sludge, radiation and genetic engineering may not be used. And um, there is a list of allowable and prohibited substances that can be found on the Organic Materials Review Institute. And that's what organic farmers use to know what products they can use as far as pesticides um, on their uh, products. And of course, OMRI is it's what it's called. That's for anybody that can go on that website and see what is actually um, certified organic or allowable under certified organic standards from the USDA. So if you're interested in that, you can always go on there and look. Um, and then there's a lot of these other logos that we see out there um, that say 100% natural, but what does that exactly mean? So there's no real definition of natural. Um, and so no one's checking that, it's not, there's no standards there. So just beware of, of things like that. But of course, you know, the, the best thing to do is uh, shop your local farmer's market, grow your own garden. So you know, you know, you can meet those farmers or actually know what you're growing and what you're putting into the product. So a lot of your farmers at the farmer's market aren't, might not wanna be um, certified organic because there's a lot of, uh, you know, there's some cost that goes into it and a lot of record keeping. Um, and so they may do things completely organic, but just not go through that certification process and, and pay that uh, additional fee and do those additional records, um, even though they do follow organic standards. So just keep that in mind as well. So now here in Kentucky, we have um, Kentucky Department of Agriculture is who certifies uh, organic farms here in Kentucky. And so um, everything through their website has all of the regulations and guidance um, and helps farmers become certified. And there's a lot of support there. We also have the Organic Association of Kentucky, OAK, who is a great organization, nonprofit organization that promotes organic agriculture here in Kentucky for those commercial farmers doing organic production. Um, they do a lot of field days, they have a farm directory um, and have a yearly conference. So a lot of information out there for more commercial scale um, organic farming. But I know as today, um, what we're gonna be talking about obviously is organics in the home garden. But I just want you to be aware of these resources and you know, those labeling, the labeling that's out there. So what organic is not, it's not just about the avoidance of conventional chemicals. Um, it's more just substituting inputs for inorganic, organic inputs for inorganic inputs. So it's not just about using organic pesticides versus synthetic. There's a lot of principles that go into organic gardening in your home garden, or even that organic farmers prescribe to. So um, a big emphasis is on building healthy soil um, so that you have a big diverse um, microbial population. That's all the earthworms and all those little microbes in your soil that are gonna help make your plants healthy. 
um, that you are, are making sure you have good organic matter, uh, balancing your pH, have good fertility, um, and doing a lot of a kind of a holistic approach, which is making sure that you're managing pests, keeping your soil healthy, all those things together um, as a whole system. And so with as home gardeners, we're doing, we're trying to do a balanced approach. So you're going to be willing to accept some, accept some damage from pests. And you're going to be willing, you're going to have to be willing to spend more time uh, working on your soil and then scouting for those problems in the garden. That way you're not having to worry about putting all those extra amendments on there like fertilizers and pesticides. So we're going to talk about how to do that so that you have that balanced approach. So here we're going to go into the five steps to think about in um, having an organic garden. And I'll be answering questions at the end. Um, we have folks on here that will um, help me monitor the chat box. So feel free to just um, type in questions you have as I go in the chat box, and then I'll get to those at the end. And I'm going to try to keep us to under an hour here. I have a short little video of me in my garden, but if we don't have time to uh, show that, then we'll just go from there and see how it goes. So the first step I want to talk about is building the soil, because in organic gardening, that's kind of the big baseline for having a good, um, a, good gar a good organic garden is building the soil and the soil feeds the plants and keeps them healthy. So one of the key things there is organic matter. So organic matter does a lot of things. It improves your soil structure and drainage. Um, so it makes the soil have that good, nice uh, loamy um, structure to it. So it has good, good aeration, good drainage. Uh, and also increases your good microbes and earthworms. Those are all those organisms in the soil that are breaking down your, your um, nutrients to be available to the plants and helping the plants fend off disease. So it's kind of like our uh, microbiome in our, in our body. Um, as you know, there's so many pro probiotics out there now for people to take. Well, so it's similar in the soil. So we have to build up those healthy microorganism populations in our body it's the same in the soil for the plant. You wanna build those up in the soil to then help the plant be healthy. And so having good soil um, does that. And then um, that organic matter holds those nutrients and then slowly releases them to be available to the plants. And so what are organic amendments? What can you do to, to increase your organic matter? So there's lots of options out there um, in your organic garden. So, Cover crops are a really great way of building organic matter. Now cover crops, I know obviously they are um, taking space where you would wanna have a crop, but a lot of people for home gardeners especially that might not be, have enough space to do a cover crop. Now farmers will have a whole field that they designate during the season or you know what at, during a, a certain time where they're not having a crop in that soil. But if you don't have the space for that, a good time to do it is in the fall. So you can plant something like winter wheat, wheat, winter wheat or rye or crimson clover. We'll do a mixed bag here in Woodford County sometimes to give out to residents of winter wheat and crimson clover. You plant that in the fall, like in September, October, and then it grows all through the winter. And this helps cut down on weeds. So you're not having to worry about all those winter weeds coming in and taking over in the garden. And it's also uh, fixing nutrients for to bring to put back into the soil, providing that organic matter. Um, it helps all, uh, prevent erosion as well because you're covering the soil. And then manure is another great source of organic matter. Um, you know, do beware with your manure to know where you're getting it, but you can use compost and manure. I mean, obviously they, you can find those bagged compost manure uh, or you can buy manure by um, the truckload or load that you can get um, Locally, uh, most places you can find uh, somewhere where they are selling composted manure. If you're putting it on fresh, you want to put it on the in the fall so that you have about 90 to 120 days is kind of the regulation for, uh, especially organic certified for farmers standards. You have to um, apply it 90 days prior to um, having the, the for when you're going to have your crop, uh, 90 to 120 days, and so then. Um, Compost is your other um, option for organic matter. And so you can uh, obviously buy that bag. You can also make your own compost. So I've done composting at home for a long time. Um, and that's you know using food scraps and our grass clippings and leaves and all those different things that we put into compost. We don't necessarily get a whole lot out of it. 
in our own compost, but we have a three bin system like this bottom picture here. And so that's another thing that we can add to our garden um, to increase our organic matter. And then mulch. Um, and so you wanna be careful with mulch though. So, um, one of the hardwood mulch, if you put down hardwood mulch in your garden, you don't wanna be mixing that into the soil because it can tie up nutrients, but it's a good, a good option for pathways. Um, but some good mulch, some good uh, mulch would be like straw or leaves that you put down, and then eventually they will just break down in the soil and add to organic matter. Um, they would just be a topping of mulch, but then as they break down through the years, um, through the season, then they provide that organic matter. So those are all the options for organic amendment amendments to increase your organic matter in your soil. And then, um, is your soil healthy? A key to that is getting soil test. Um, we provide every, um, it, every county in Kentucky has an extension office. And so just contact your local extension office and get a soil test. Um, you just need two cups from your garden, you bring it in. A lot of us offer free uh, soil testing or at least a voucher through the year to get your soil samples for free. Um, and if not, it's a minimal fee of like $6. Um, so it's so worth it to do. We recommend every three years or so to get that, um, to get that test. And so there's an optimum pH level of six to 6.8, but we make recommendations on the soil sample to then help you know what you need to add to your soil. Um, I know a lot of soils here were very high in phosphorus and potassium levels. So then that's gonna tell you some important things like you just need nitrogen or um, you know, certain things that you need to, or maybe you need to add lime to your garden, but you don't wanna do any of those things till you have that soil uh, test to refer to. And I'll talk more about fertilizing as we go. But as you can see with that organic matter level, ideally you have an organic matter level of about 4%. So next, I'm gonna talk about right plant, right place and time. So um, choosing the right plants and seed. So there's a lot of options out there. Of course, you can start your own plants from seed or direct seed into the garden. Um, if you're buying uh, tr seedlings or, tr or transplants like tomatoes or peppers, you just want to make sure that they're healthy. You want to look for any kind of pests that might be on them um, before you purchase them or any kind of maybe spotting on the leaves. Just be careful for stuff like that. Um, an example of, uh, say, for example, if you're buying a tomato plant and it's already got uh, little tomatoes on it or blooms. You just want to be careful for stuff like that because if it's in a small pot, it shouldn't already be producing. Um, and it means that it's probably been stressed and dried out. And so the plant is, you know, trying to already produce. So you don't want to buy something like that. So just be careful for, for seedlings you're buying to make sure they're healthy. And then as far as buying seeds, uh, there's lots of options. There's open pollinated or heirloom, as they call it, um, which a lot of you, I'm sure, uh, get to get all those different unique varieties. There's hybrid there's organic seed. Um, and then I just wanted to, to point out that a lot of seeds now will say, um, you know, non-GMO, but there are no genetically modified garden seeds available for sale to the general public. So that's more of just a marketing scheme that companies use. Um, and so it's important for you to be aware that there aren't genetically modified garden seeds available. Those are for crops like your soy, be, your soy and, um, and corn and things like that, that larger producers are gonna use because it's very expensive to get genetically modified seed. So it's not gonna be something that is available to home gardeners. Um, so as far as planting in, in the right place, you wanna pick a good site. And of course, as far as for planting um, methods, you can plant in a garden, in, in a container, in the ground or in raised beds. As you can see here, there's raised beds. You wanna get at least six to eight hours of sun per day. Uh, you wanna have good access to water and then make sure you have protection from any critters, um, any kind of wildlife, deer, rabbits, all that kind of stuff. But I know that um, some of you have, a lot of you have had a basic vegetable gardening class, so we won't focus a lot on these things. Um, but this is my garden at home, so I do have raised beds. I have two small kids, and so we did find, we do have an in-ground garden as well next to this that we grow some corn and some other larger things like watermelon and things that spread out. But we did find that with the raised beds, we've increased them more and more over the, over the years. We have several now, but 
Um, we just found that it was easier to have that smaller contained area to keep it weeded. And with the two small kids, it's harder for us to find the time to go into the garden. Um, so we do um, the raised beds now. And then as you can see, we do, I do have landscape fabric now in the rows uh, to keep, help keep weeds from coming up. But we also have the wood chips um, that we put down. We actually just called a local uh, tree company and said, if you're in our area, they have to pay to uh, throw away those, to dispose of those wood chips at the landfill. So um, we just told them if you're in the area and you cut a tree, uh, drop the wood chips off at our house. So we came home to a giant pile of wood chips in our driveway, uh, but it was it was great because we could use it in the in the rows in the um, in the garden and um, other other places. This is what I actually started out with was just mounded beds, which is a really good option too. So this is what we started with, and then we've slowly gone into um, the raised beds. So just a couple of uh, examples of, of different um, situations you can have, and then of course planting at the right time is very um, critical. And um, I'm sure most of you know about our ID 128 or Vegetable Gardening in Kentucky guidebook, which is extremely helpful uh, for all kinds of different things, but it has this calendar that tells you exactly when to plant. So depending on what part of Kentucky you're in, we're in central Kentucky here in Woodford County. Um, so I can go down and say, um, you know, when, when should I plant cabbage? Okay, March 25th. So it has a calendar to ensure that you're planting at the right time. And so we have three different seasons for planting um, here in Kentucky. We have our cool season, which is a spring and fall crops, our warm season, which is the summer crops. So it's split up into um, three. So even right now in July, you, uh, you're going to be already starting to plant and plan for your fall garden. Uh, and that, that Vegetable Garden Kentucky guidebooks is very, very helpful for uh, providing tables for those dates. Um, and when to transplant as well, if you're starting your own seeds or even um, just transplanting out into the garden. Okay, so the next thing um, is fertilizing wisely. So there are three main plant nutrients, your nitrogen, which is uh, helps support your leaf growth, your phosphorus, which is the roots, flowers, and fruits of your, of your plants, and then potassium, which is overall health and disease resistance. And I think I mentioned earlier that here in Woodford County, we have really high levels of phosphorus and potassium, and this is all from those soil tests that are important to get. As I get soil tests in from people, the, the phosphorus and potassium are always really high. So usually I'm just recommending nitrogen as your fertilizer amendment. And there's an example here of an all-purpose uh, fertilizer uh, garden tone, which has a value of 3% nitrogen, 3% phosphorus, and three, or, sorry, 3% nitrogen, 4% phosphorus, and 4% potassium. Okay, so why organic fertilizers? So um, a lot of them will supply a wide range of nutrients. So not just those macronutrients as we call them, the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium are macronutrients, but also a lot of the little micronutrients that uh, plants need as well, which usually are in our soils, but these can provide some of those as well. Um, and they provide them slowly. So they usually um, are released in the soil when you put them down in a, in a slowly over time kind of like what the Osmocote, if you've used that before, it's a slow release fertilizer. So most of your organic fertilizers are gonna be like a medium to slow release. And then some have, um, are supplemented with beneficial microbes, but you know, if you're building a healthy soil, you're naturally gonna have those microbes in there. So you shouldn't need something like that. And as I mentioned before, the, the kind of the central tenant in sustainable and organic agriculture is to feed the soil to then feed the crop. And hopefully you're doing that between fixing, you know, uh, uh, putting in that organic matter that we talked about, but also fertilizing properly. And then here is a table of uh, many different uh, sources for uh, fertilizers, for um, organic fertilizers. And so then it'll show you the percent nitrogen, percent potassium, uh, phosphorus and percent potassium, and then their availability, how slow. Most of them are medium to slow, as you can see. Some of them are medium to rapid, but none of them are very rapid release, which is good for the plants because they're gonna take them up over time. So those are some options for your organic fertilizers. And then here is a good table from that um, Vegetable Garden Kentucky guidebook that tells you the timing for side dressing your vegetables. So through the season, there's gonna be times where this, this is when you're really gonna to want to fertilize those plants. 
Um, so for example, um, let's see on here, peppers, um, you're gonna want to fertilize them after the first fruit set. So once you first see those little peppers on there. So this is a good guide to knowing when to fertilize. And then um, the fourth thing we're gonna go into here is managing um, problems organically and that is pests and disease. Um, so an important thing in organic gardening is to make sure that you're scouting the garden regularly. If you can um, daily, if you, you know, as much as you can get in the garden to kind of make sure that you find those problems before they get out of control. And then you have to resort to spraying because ideally in organic gardening, you're finding that problem, being able to take care of it, either squishing the bugs uh, versus waiting till their populations are out of control. And then you have to resort, resort to spraying. So as you can see here, uh, Colorado potato beetle and their eggs, a squash bug and a stink bug. And those are all their little eggs that you'd find at the back of the leaves. A good way to exclude pests in an organic garden is using row cover. Um, so this can be called reme, many different things, but basically um, it is what they use, uh, used to use as tobacco cloth, which you might you know, know uh, it as, but um, there's really easy ways to put this. You can put it straight down on the crop, but the best way is to have um, PVC pipe, as you can see in this picture down here that you um, make a little hoop with, and um, it's basically like a little mini tunnel, and then that can exclude pests. And it can also be used um, to protect crops in the spring and the fall from frost or freeze, so that especially in the fall, a lot of people will use it in cover so that they, you can have lettuce into the winter time. But if you get the kind that is, um, uh, that has, I, I'm, I'm trying to think of the weights right now, but the lowest weight to where it, you have a lot of good airflow um, during the summertime, so it won't get hot under there, but it protects from the pests getting on the plants. And I can get you that information on weights if you need it. Um, and another important thing is recognizing it, uh, good beneficial insects. So there are a lot of great insects out there that uh, you know, as soon as people see an insect, they assume it's bad, but most of the insects out there are going to be good um, and are going to be helping our garden. And so being able to recognize them in all their different forms, their adult, adult and larval forms. So as you can see in the top here, there's an adult ladybug and that's the larval form. So they look completely different, which is, is why it's really important to be able to recognize that. And then um, an assassin bug here on the bottom right, eating what looks like a larval form of a potato bug. Um, so the good insects that you want to keep and promote, especially in organic gardening. Um, and then having plant companion, companions. I know there was a class done on companion planting, so you can look back at the recording for that. Uh, but there's many flowers that will attract those beneficial insects to your garden. Some examples would be dill and parsley, um, mint, you got to watch for, of course, of course, it can get out of control. Um, but thyme, sage, basil, zinnias, marigolds, daisies, salvia, and nasturtiums, all kinds of different things you can put in the garden to attract beneficials. Um, but of course, there's no silver bullet really for insect control in organic gardening. Organic farmers really struggle with um, pest control in, in their organic systems because there's not a really a lot of really good products to, um, to uh, spray on insects in, or, in organic production. So it's gonna be really important to begin with, with healthy plants, building that soil um, to help make ensure that they are remain healthy, avoid any kind of excess fertilizing. That's important to follow that side dressing chart so you know when is an important time to fertilize and then avoid uh, any excess uh, irrigation or water that all of those things were, will increase um, your insects. So there are some organic insecticides, of course, that do um, that you can use uh, that are made from natural products and they're generally safer for the environment. Um, some examples are pyrethrins, um, BT, insecticidal soaps, and then kale and clay or surround, which is something you put on that um, kind of is more of a deterrent than anything else. And then here's a table. Um, I know that there, uh, you, you were sent the link to this publication, so you will have all this information, or I mean, I'm sorry, to this presentation, so you will have all this information on there, but this is all the different insecticides approved for organic production that you can use in your home garden. And it tells you what pests are controlled. Uh, another thing I do wanna point out too, is it's important to try to pick 
um, insecticides that are more targeted to a specific insect instead of like an all-purpose spray that kills everything. And the reason for that being that, um, you know, you don't want to kill all those beneficial insects. So an example would be your Bacillus thuringiensis at the top there, your BT, is specific for caterpillars. So it's just going to kill those cabbage loopers and um, imported cabbage worm, corny worm, uh, those caterpillars and not everything else. So it's good to know what insect you have so then you know what product to use to kill it. Um, and this is just an, an, uh, an example of, um, once again, from that Vegetable Gardening Kentucky guidebook that I'm going to continue to reference. I highly encourage you to use this guidebook. Um, but it, it, in each, for each crop, so this one's for tomatoes, it'll list all of the common insects that, um, that affect those plants. And then it'll give you uh, treatments of insecticides that you can use. It has options for uh, organic and um, conventional pesticides that you can use to, to kill those pests. Another publication that I highly recommend is an, uh, the, an IPM scouting guide for natural enemies of vegetable pests in Kentucky. It has these amazing pictures that will help you learn to identify those beneficial insects that we were talking about. So like that ladybug, knowing what the larval form of that looks like, so that then you can, when you do see them in the garden, you're not going to spray them. Um, let's see, what time do we have here? I am going to go ahead and show this video. <laughs> show you uh, uh, some of the tips that we talked about through this presentation in our actual garden here. This is my little boy Theo eating one of our fresh picked cucumbers. Is it good? All right, so we are going to look at um, a couple squash plants we have. They're actually zucchini plants. First, I want to point out this one drooping versus this, one, this healthy one. This is one of the first signs that you'll see of squash vine borer. It'll start to wilt like that. Um, and then you want to go to the stem, and I'll show a quick uh, part of, of digging that squash vine borer out. But you'll see in the stem, um, this split's actually just from the wind knocking it over. But you'll see fraz coming out of the stem. I'm not finding it on this one. Um, but that's the first sign of squash vine borer, and it eventually kills the plant um, pretty quickly, actually. But the other thing I wanted to show you for scouting, it's really important to go through the garden um, as much as possible every day, ideally, but as much as you can to scout for things before they get out of control so that you don't have to resort to spraying because spraying is, you know, something you want to do very last minute. The first thing you want to do is scout and try to address the problem before it's a bigger issue. So something like this you can start turning over leaves to look for things like cucumber beetle and squash bug. Those are on all your cucurbic plants. So squashes, um, cucumbers, all of those plants will have, um, and I know I found some earlier, uh, these pests that cause a lot of problems. Cucumber beetle can cause bacterial wilt. Uh, can look similar to squash bug where the plant just wilts over. Um, but you wanna start checking underneath the leaves. Theo, remember where we found that? There they are. So here is a little egg cluster. And then Theo, you wanna squish those eggs. So you can just take your hands and just, I know a lot of times you actually have to rip the leaf, which is not a problem because there's plenty of leaf left there uh, for the plant. So you wanna pick those off and just like Theo showed, you squish those eggs. So things like that are a great way um, to get rid of pests. I wanted to show a few different options for spray. Um, Thuricide or BT, this is a great um, spray for caterpillars. Um, so that's something you can use that we talked about. Um, pyrethrin is kind of an all-purpose garden spray that kills many different things. Always read the label because it's very important when you're spraying any of the things. I wanted to show a copper fungicide for early blight on tomato. Here's an example of some so, Toria leaf spot, but also some early blight. Important to try to get some of those bottom leaves off of there and put some straw mulch around uh, the bottom. And then on fertilizers, fish uh, emulsion, which is 5% nitrogen, 1% um, phosphorus, 1% potassium. You usually just need nitrogen, so that's a good option for something that you would um, mix in water or you can use more of a pelletized um, granular fertilizer that you would then side dress, which is putting it next to the base of the plant um, and then working it into the soil. Would you like a cucumber release? So then another thing we use in our garden is um, some drip irrigation, which is a great way to manage the water, which we talked about. These are just some hoses here with some real small um, 
pulls every few inches. I'll show you the, the whole thing where the water drips out. These last for a really long time. And then we have a system here um, that my husband put together. He's actually shooting this video today. Um, so he's run this solid pipe and then split it off so we can turn off each line on or off depending on what's in the garden and then just run those on a timer. Um, so it's a great system. Here we are going to try to cut a squash vine borer out of a zucchini plant. So you see the little fraz, that's the droppings of them as they make their hole. That's how you can figure out where to cut the slit. And then you should see one in there. I had my husband cut this. He, uh, we really cut quite a bit more than what we want to. There it is. Ew. <laughs> so there is a squash vine borer. Um, just cut out of it. Ideally, you don't want to cut into the plant too far because then it can't survive. Um, but you know, at some point, if you, you got to catch them early with this method um, to be able to just cut the vine a little bit and pull it out. And then you would make that slit and then mound soil back up on it and it should be able to keep growing. Um, we did make a little bit bigger of a cut than, than is ideal, but we'll see how this plant does. Okay, I just thought it'd be neat to kind of show you in the garden going through, scouting for those insects, um, as we talked about in the presentation. So now I've got to go to stop share again and then reshare my screen for the PowerPoint and we'll go back. And then, um, of course, another important thing about um, any garden is suppressing weeds. Um, and a good way to do that is to mulch, um, whether you're using uh, straw or any of the, the mulch that we talked about. Um, another thing you can do is space the plants um, to where they will shade those weeds out. Now, of course, you don't want to put plants too close together. Um, you still want the airflow to help fend off the disease, um, but putting them there um, to, help, to help shade out weeds um, so that you know, you're getting the coverage of all the soil. As you can see in our garden, um, I haven't had the time to go in there recently, so there were a lot of weeds and, and some empty space that I'm going to be putting fall crops into. Um, but I try to, to get the weeds while they're small by hoeing or uh, pulling, just going through and pulling the weeds at, while, while they're small. And then planting cover crops in any open areas. I try to put cover crops on the beds in the fall so that those uh, winter weeds won't take over. Um, and then when you're bringing any kind of material into the garden, whether it's compost or anything else, you want to make sure that it, they're free of weed seeds. A lot of compost that we do uh, at home does not heat up to temperatures uh, that commercial compost does. And so a lot of weed seeds can survive and then that can be an issue. So if you're throwing weeds into your compost and it's not heating up, it's probably not going to be uh, very good to then go back and put the, that in the garden. Um, and then, uh, of course, the, the most important thing with that is not letting the seeds go, the weeds go to seed. So once they um, go to seed, then you're really going to have that problem. So getting them out small is key. Um, and there are some really great tools. My, my very favorite tool is the stirrup hoe, um, which is the second one here. And you just go through there real quickly, uh, you know, on a weekly basis, hit those weeds when they're small. And, uh, and then you don't have to worry about it. So there's some really great tools out there to make that job easier. And, and talking about mulching, um, I think I mentioned some of these, but you can use newspaper, cardboard, uh, pine straw, chopped up leaves or composted leaves, um, hardwood mulch, which I think I did mention, that would be more for in between rows. You definitely don't want that to be mixed into the soil where it can tie up nutrients as it breaks down. Um, but it makes great, a great, uh, you know, in between the rows to keep weeds down. Um, you can use wheat straw, uh, plastic, and um, cover crops, of course, as we mentioned, and then landscape fabric, which I did have down in between rows in the garden in the video. And here in this picture below, well, here in the top, of course, is straw. And then here in the bottom, there's a combination of some, this was more of just smothering out a garden, um, but the combination is some, some uh, cardboard and and, um, and some newspaper and plastic or, or landscape fabric. Okay, 
now we'll talk a little bit about managing diseases. Um, and so as you can see in my video, I don't have uh, mulch around the bottom, the base of my tomatoes, but for things like early blight and other things, it is good to have that mulch to help splashing from the soil. Um, so trying to keep mulch down will help, but also choosing resistant varieties as much as you can. They have little uh, things on the um, on seed packs or when you buy plants uh, to tell you what they're what diseases they're resistant to. So trying to find those that are most resistant to, resistant to most diseases will help. And then you want to remove and destroy any disease plants um, as much as soon as you can. Obviously, if they're in the early stages of disease, you can pull off those, like for example, on tomatoes, pull off those bottom leaves, maybe spray with some copper to protect the rest of the plant. Um, but once they get really bad, it's best to pull them out so they're not spreading to other plants. And then uh, a lot of people will prune on tomatoes and sometimes that'll help. With, that's where I talk about with trimming plants to help increase airflow so that the plants dry out and, um, and help uh, with disease. And then of course, rotating crops is really import, important. Um, and crop rotation is definitely the best way to avoid disease if you can do it. I know in, in home gardens, a lot of times um, it can be uh, difficult to rotate crops if you don't have a lot of, um, of space to do that, but it does help in, in, um, in controlling disease and pest problems. Um, and so there's many different examples of, of diseases, um, but you want to avoid rotating between similar groups of vegetables. And we'll talk about related groups. So there's coal crops, there's solanaceous crops, and all of the, the, what falls under that, greens, root crops, and legumes. And so you're wanting to rotate between all those different. So you, know, you would rotate between root crops in one bed one year, and the next year you put coal crops there. So rotating between these families because you don't want to put, oh, and cucurbit crops. Sorry, that's the one that was missing there too. Um, so you don't want to plant tomatoes and peppers in the same spot every year if you can avoid it. Instead, you know, plant tomatoes in one bed one year, move them to another bed and plant cucumbers there the next year. And that'll help uh, cut down on your disease and pest problems. And then this is another table from Vegetable Gardening Kentucky Guidebook uh, that gives those plant families. So that'll help you remember uh, what families to rotate between. There's also um, rotating the crops by nutrient cycling. And so there are some crops, um, they put them in categories of heavy givers, meaning they don't take a lot of, um, of nutrients, light feeders, and then heavy feeders. So heavy feeders are what's gonna take the most nutrients out of the soil. So then you know, if you're coming in with a crop after those heavy feeders, you're gonna have to make sure that you're supplying extra nutrients uh, with fertilizers to those crops. So thinking about that as well in the garden. And then as far as organically approved fungicides, there is several options out there. Uh, a kind of a broad spectrum fungicide is Bacillus subtilis, subtilis. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, right. but Serenade or Sonata. There's neem oil, there's copper, um, and then there's uh, potassium bicarbonate, sulfur, and kaolin clay. And as I said, you have access to this, public, this PowerPoint, so I won't go into a whole lot of detail and all of those, um, but those are all the different fungicides you can use uh, to protect various um, diseases. So uh, step five, the final step is observe and care for your garden. So walk through your garden, as I mentioned, and as that video showed, going through, turning over leaves, just seeing what's going on in the garden, managing those weeds while they're small, going through there weekly if you can with that stirrup hoe or whatever tool you like best, um, destroying any of those bad bugs, fertilizing as you need to. You could maybe come up with like a, a chart that will help you remember what crop is ready to fertilize. Um, succession planting um, is a great way to continue to have crops through the year. So you plant something, uh, seed out some beets, for example, and then you wait uh, two or three weeks and then seed them again so that you, once the, that crop's pulled out, you have another one ready to be harvested. And then keep a log so that you remember from year to year what problems you have and what to be ready for for the next season. Uh, watering, water wisely. So water in the morning if you can, and if not um, possible, um, you know, at least uh, morning or afternoon, you don't wanna water at night um, because then that water's gonna stay on those plants and then promote more disease. Uh, and you wanna try to water the soil as much as possible, not the leaves. That's why I have that drip irrigation system in my garden but you can also have these soaker hoses like you see in the bottom picture here. This top picture 
Ideally, you don't want to be doing that where you're watering the leaves because then the water is going to sit on those leaves and cause disease. Um, so try to use drip irrigation as much as possible. Uh, another uh, important part is water deeply, less often rather than, you know, just a tiny bit of water uh, multiple times through the week. One big soaking of watering is much better than, um, than a lot of small waterings. That helps develop really deep root systems so then the plant can um, handle drought situations better. This is another table from Vegetable Gardening Kentucky Guidebook, and it tells you critical times to water uh, the various crops, similar to that side dressing fertilizer chart. Tells you when to water. And then as the season ends, make sure you remove any kind of plant degree, uh, debris that may have been diseased, get that out of there. Um, mulch any kind of bare soil or plant cover crops, you can, or you can plant crops like garlic. Um, but cover crops are a great uh, thing to plant to, to cover the soil. And so just to review, we're wrapped up here now, but the five steps are build your soil, because your soil is going to feed the plants. Make sure you pick the right plant, the right place in the right time, planting at the right time, uh, in the right spot, making sure you're fertilizing, not too much, just right, use that table and, um, that, that I talked about. Uh, manage those problems organically. So talking about insects and disease, making sure you're aware of them uh, before they become a problem. And then, you know, you have those organic options of sprays to use and then go through and observe uh, your garden on a regular basis. I know I went through that uh, kind of talking fast, so I apologize for um, going through quickly, but definitely as you have questions, we'll answer those in the chat box here in just a second. But there's some really great resources. The one I mentioned through the whole presentation, that Home Vegetable Garden in Kentucky guidebook. We also have a great publication of gardening in small spaces that talks about how to build raised beds, you know, what soil you need. Um, there's a publication on organic fertilizers if you want to learn more about that. And then here's a, pub, uh, a uh, link to that publication on um, IPM scouting guides for, um, for vegetable pests in Kentucky. So enjoy your organic garden. 